So the next presentation is by Philip Rudiger, and he is going to speak about build polished data driven application directly from your Pandas or Excel pipelines. And if I'm not right, Philip, you are associated with Anaconda, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Hopefully, so, everyone can see my screen. Yeah, I can. And if you could just start with a short bio of yourself, that would be wonderful. Okay, yeah, perfect. So yeah, my name is Philip Rüdiger. Uh, I'm based in Berlin, Germany. I work for Anaconda here, and I'm a senior software engineer, primarily working on kind of open source software or develop various open source tools, uh, which you'll see in the course of this presentation. And yeah, I'm very excited to share this talk with, with you. All right, so I'll just uh, jump straight in. Um, so yeah, I'll be yeah. talking to you today about uh, building polished data-driven applications directly from your pandas or XRA pipelines. Um, so to start off with, what do I mean by a pipeline? Um, so let's take a very simple sentence as an example. A person drives to the store to buy food, then he drives home, prepares, cooks, serves, and eats the food before cleaning the dishes. And so in Python, you might want to write this as a series of methods operating on some object. So you might have a person that uh, kind of performs various actions, such as driving to the store, buying food, driving home, preparing food, cooking food, serving food, eating food, and then cleaning the dishes, right? And so in Python, we call this method chaining, and that's really what I mean by building pipelines uh, in Python. So let's jump straight in and look at a particular data pipeline, so actually operating on some data set, right? Um, so here, we're looking at uh, the Seattle, Seattle bike data set, uh, which is here loaded as a data frame, I have skipped the loading step. And so we now might want to perform a range of operations, right? So this is actually a pretty large data set. If we look at the length of this data set, um, this is actually pretty long. And so we might, might want to resample it uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so we're resampling it, take the sum, and then we want to smooth it a little bit because it's quite noisy data and it might jump around. So we provide a rolling window, right? Provide, perform the sum on that. And then we might want to plot it. And so here we're using a tree plot to plot it, which gives us this nice interactive plot. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But really what we're focusing on here is this pipeline of operations. And so uh, both pandas and x-ray, as we'll see later, uh, provide this ability to chain various operations in a row um, to apply some pipeline. But um, at the same time, kind of we've kind of picked very relatively arbitrary um, to make relatively arbitrary decisions here, right? So daily resampling, uh, we actually have this data on, on a kind of a minute basis or even, even at a final resolution. So daily is kind of an arbitrary decision. Uh, this particular value for the rolling mean or rolling sum is a very arbitrary value, more smoothing, maybe we want less smoothing and so on. And so every time we want to change any of these things, we have to go back in, edit that, and kind of find the actual um, the particular values that we want or that's appropriate for the effects that we're trying to find, uh, the, the kind of uh, particular transformations we want to do perform on our data. And that process can take a while, right? It's, it's kind of going back and forth. And so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about exploratory workflows. And if data is messy, you have to iterate on it. You have to really, to make discoveries in your data, you have to be able to iterate on it fast. And so fast iteration cycles are what makes discovery possible and what has made particularly notebooks so very popular, right? They let you kind of uh, do this kind of process of going back and forth between editing the code, viewing the output. Um, and so that's why notebooks are powerful. But even a small amount of coding, the, the bit I was just talking about kind of uh, editing these particular variables here, even that kind of interrupts this, this fast iteration cycle, right? Um, so if we're trying to find the particular rolling window that's most accurate, uh, kind of going back and forth and, and incrementing the value or decrementing the value, it takes some time and it's, it's kind of interrupting and it's, it's not really what we want. And so that's why, kind of why are we introducing this new, new concept of dot interactive, which I'll kind of explain in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, the original um, inspiration for it came from Tom Nicholas in this issue on X-Array. And so we won't into dive into the issue, but if you want to kind of dig into that and see the discussion there, it's quite interesting. Um, but I'll just read the, the kind of description of the problem out uh, that Tom Nichols provided there. So for most users who are exploring their data, it will be common to find themselves rerunning the same cells repeatedly, but with slightly different values. So why not allow them to add widgets directly to their pipelines? But importantly, we also need to make sure that 
Uh, we don't require users to kind of learn new APIs. They should just be able to use their existing knowledge of kind of the Pandas API, the XRA API, to just drop in widgets and get an interactive uh, version of their existing data pipeline, right? And so what is dot .interactive? Well, right now it's a monkey patched accessor on which supports the common data APIs, whether that's Pandas data frames, DAS data frames, uh, Rapids QDF data frames, or X-ray objects. It is shipped with the HP plot library. Uh, so we'll dig, as I promised, I'll, we'll dig into what the HP plot library is in a minute. Um, but that interactive allows us to change these, chain these interactive pipeline methods and replays when any of the inputs, i.e. any of the widgets that we feed into this pipeline change. Um, it also supports Dunder methods, which allows us to do mathematical operations. So if you're not familiar with Dunder methods, it's basically the things that allow objects to, to, to implement things like mathematical operations, plus minus, multiplication, and a bunch of other stuff, right? And then it also mirrors the API of the wrapped objects. And so let's take an example here. So let's actually stick, get it started with an example. So the way we install uh, the dot inter interactive API on our pandas objects um, is by importing hvplot.pandas. There's also a method you can import to, or a function you can import to enable this explicitly. Uh, but this import is the simplest way to get started. And once we do that, we have this interactive accessor on our object, which turns our regular data frame into an interactive object. And so here we now have a handle on this interactive object. Uh, we can now perform all the regular operations that you might want to perform on a pandas data frame, except it now supports widgets. And so if I, for example, create a panel widget, a date range slider widget, I can now kind of filter the index by the start value of this date range, the uh, end value of this date range, and then basically show us the first three rows. And so now when I drag this slider here, we kind of, we can see the output below update in response to the dragging of the widget. Um, so in this way, we kind of built a very, very simple interactive pipeline, right? It's, it's basically just two steps, filter, and then call dot head. So we can see the first three rows. Very simple, um, but it kind of gets the point across, right? So how does that work? And so if you don't care, tune out for just a second. Um, I'll just briefly talk about how this actually works, right? Um, so when dot interactive is instantiated, it wraps the current, the starting object. So here in this particular case, right, when we call this, we're wrapping this Seattle bike data frame. Uh, it queries that for its methods and dynamically mirrors its APIs. So internally, that's just uh, calling get adger, set adger, and those are mirrored. Uh, those are basically intercepted. And so whenever you call any method, it kind of checks, does that method actually exist on the underlying object? And then intercepts that. It also, um, when you make any method call or kind of do the uh, slicing semantics, it intercepts any widgets or parameter, parameter objects you're passing in and wraps those to ensure that those are interactive inputs to our pipeline. It also implements various dunder methods so we can talk, do the mathematical operations. And then when we access any method, it temporarily stores that method accessor so that we can resolve it when it's called. And finally, um, when the output is displayed, it's rendered using uh, the panel library or holoviews potentially. And whenever any of the uh, widgets or inputs change, the, the output is updated. Uh, so that's helpful. Um, so before we dive any, any deeper into um, how this works and what you can do with it, uh, let's just briefly discuss what is HBplot, what is panel, right? Not everyone's familiar with those. So HBplot is a library I originally wrote um, to kind of mirror the dot plot API um, which is present on pandas objects, on X-ray objects, uh, which provides you kind of static mapalib output, um, provide, but provides a really, really convenient entry point to kind of do exploratory visualization of your data. Um, so it also supports GeoPandas, Dask data frames, Rapids data frames, and a few other libraries. It then renders the outputs to all of these objects, which in turn uh, give you a interactive bokeh plot that you can kind of zoom in on and explore, um, which is different from the regular mapolib output you're used to from pandas. Um, and so this dot, new dot interactive API, which also lives in hvplot, now extends this, these interactive processes that we've kind of added for uh, visualization to data exploration, data man manipulation, um, and makes those interactive for you too. 
So all of that is also built on top of Panel. If you're not familiar with Panel, it's basically a, a dashboarding library, kind of a very high-level dashboarding library, which lets you build um, applications either in Jupyter and kind of prototype them in Jupyter, and then lets you deploy them on a Bokeh server. Um, so it, it supports rendering a wide range um, of widgets, various all, all different pl plotting libraries that you might think of in, in uh, the PyData ecosystem are supported. And this way, we can kind of take the output and update it whenever anything changes. Um, so that's very helpful. Um, so that's the two libraries this is built on. Now let's actually look at a data pipeline where uh, we're applying some of these, these concepts that we've talked about, right? Um, so previously we kind of talked about, we have this Seattle bike data set, we've made it interactive, and now we can call various methods on it um, to build this interactive pipeline. Uh, so instead of kind of providing just uh, the day, uh, daily resampling, we now provide a widget which allows us to switch between daily weekly and monthly resampling. Uh, instead of pr providing a fixed rolling window, uh, we provide a widget that uh, allows us to kind of have a slider to change those values. Right? And so now, uh, just by kind of replacing this original data frame and uh, replacing the fixed arguments with widgets, we've now built this interactive little app that lets us, lets us switch between uh, daily, weekly, monthly resampling allows us to adjust the rolling window. And so here we can kind of smooth it until we have the particular uh, plot that we want or gain the insight that we want, right? Um, so we can see it's kind of, we've got uh, in winter, uh, bike trips kind of drop and some really pick up. And so uh, this is something, well, we can also see in the daily version, but in the monthly version, we might not see it. And so here we can gain the insights that we want. Um, just by kind of fiddling with widgets instead of kind of manually editing uh, the values in here. Um, so I also promised you this would also support mathematical expressions. Um, so again, we've kind of resampled our data. This time we just fixed the daily resampling. Um, but then we provide the window as an interactive input. We've assigned that to a variable, which then allows us to kind of take the uh, resampled version, the interactive resampled version, and subtract the mean of that from itself, which basically gives us the difference uh, from the mean. So we can see here how things drop below the, the average, um, kind of the number of bike trips drops below the average in, uh, I assume this is winter, and then pick up again. Um, so here, um, in this way, it kind of, it, we can perform any operations that we want, uh, you'll also notice here that we've um, used hvplot again to plot it, which means we can, A, we can get hover information, we can zoom the pan around, right? Uh, we've also provided uh, rasterization here, which means that uh, if we were to do this on a, uh, I always forget what the, no, this is monthly, I think, uh, if we did this on a, uh, ooh, if anyone can remind me what the, if we had a second by second resampling, uh, this might take a little minute actually. So that was probably not the best idea. Um, but using this rasterize, we can even uh, get a visualized data sets this large. Um, so, but that was a particularly terrible idea of mine. Um, so for now, I'm going to have to stop the kernel there and then restart the presentation. Um, so sorry about that. Um, don't resample such a large data set on a secondly basis is the basic <laughs> is the idea there. Um, okay, so we've seen that we can perform kind of method chaining, we can perform mathematical operations, um, but we can also kind of provide our own uh, methods in this data processing pipeline such that we can pipe things into other functions, other objects. And so here we've built this little interactive applet where we now take a different data set, uh, the penguins data set, if you're not familiar, it's just a collection of penguins um, in the Antarctic, which with various measurements about them. And so again, we're kind of declaring two widgets, A, to filter by the species, secondly, to filter by the sex. And then we can again use the regular panda semantics to A, do the filtering. And then uh, we can pipe that into any object that we want, any function that we want. Uh, so here we're piping it into this tabular widget Tabulator is a very powerful kind of table uh, widget that exists in panel, uh, which has things like pagination. So that if we had, if this was 
10,000 rows or a million rows, this would still work. It's just fetching particularly the rows that we want. And now if I kind of switch between the different species, you can see that the table below also updates. Uh, so, yeah. um, if I switch species to the sex, uh, you can see the table updates. And you can see here, we can kind of go to the last, flip through the pages. So that's quite powerful. Um, this, this pipe method, uh, which exists on Pandas data frames, kind of lets you do arbitrary transforms using a function. And in the context of uh, hvplot.interactive, uh, this, is super, this is a superpower because it lets us pipe things into uh, any object that we want and render it, render our data in various uh, ways. OK, so the, another very important concept are terminating methods. Um, so a pipeline, right? Pipes keeps piping data. The more methods you add, it keeps piping the data through. Like every time it returns a new object, you're chaining things. Uh, but at some point, you might want to kind of get the actual object that you're rendering back. You might want to terminate this pipeline into an object that you can display or work with in other ways. And so that's what the terminating methods are for. There's four of them. Uh, one basically is the Holovies method that just returns a Holovies object. This only works if the term, if the object that we're uh, terminating on is a Holovies object. And so in the case of using hvplot, you would get a Holovies object back. And that's when you'd use this. It's just an, this kind of does an efficient update of uh, the plots. That panel, kind of your data could return anything. It can be a data frame itself. It could be anything we can pipe into a panel object. Panel will render and update as the widgets change. Then we can also get back the widgets themselves, right? We want to lay, lay out the widgets separately from the actual output put them in a different place in our little application, and we'll see that in a minute. And so in this way, we can kind of get a layout. Um, we can also get a layout of both the widgets and the panel in one. And so it's kind of a helper around getting a column of these two objects. OK, so those are the terminating methods. So far, we've um, focused entirely on pandas data frames, but I, the title here promised that this would also work uh, for X-ray data sets. And so here we're going to work with a very simple, this is the, uh, in the X-ray uh, docs, you'll find this, this particular data set quite frequently. It's air temperatures uh, over the US uh, over time. Uh, so this is basically, if you're not familiar with X-ray, X-ray is basically a pandas for n-dimensional data. So here you can think of this as a 3D cube of uh, air temperatures over as a grid over the US over time, right? So you've got images which are stacked over time. So you've got this uh, 3D stack. And so uh, the nice thing here is um, this also supports interactive. And so we can do uh, basically a integer selection. We have an integer slider starting at zero, ending at 10. And now we can slide over uh, each slice in this object. So we're stepping through time here. Uh, here, this little wrapper is the representation that X-Array provides for this, this particular output. Um, so as we're, we're going through time here, you can imagine we're kind of crossing through time. Um, but more interestingly, we can kind of actually use the HVPlot API to plot this as well. And so here um, you see the same data set now, again, uh, explorable through time, except we're now using the cell method, which is basically selection by actual uh, variable value. And so here, we're actually getting the output here is no longer the integer, but the particular time that we're slicing on, right? Um, and so um, interactive is quite smart here. It actually knows what the cell method is. It kind of can infer that if you give it a discrete slider, that it should create an instance of this discrete slider and populate it with all the times um, so that we can cross through time. We're also, again, making use of the mathematical expression operations so that we subtract the mean air temperature over this entire time period. So we can kind of see the uh, divergence from the mean. And then finally, we're also providing another widget to kind of select between different types of plots. So here, by default, we're plotting the image. Plotting this as an image, we can also switch to plotting it as a contour uh, or a filled contour. Um, and all of this still allows us to switch to kind of uh, uh, drag the slider to go through time. So that's pretty neat. Again, works just in the same way as pandas. And in fact, um, one other nice thing is that um, since we're just mirroring the API, right, all the doc strings still exist. So if you're doing kind of, if you're working in 
IPython or in a notebook, we can still get back the doc string even on this interactive object, right? Uh, so that's that's really nice. Um, the other nice thing is, of course, we've kind of focused on HV plot output because it's cool and it gives us these interactive plots. But the regular .plot API, both for pandas and um, X-array, still work. So here we're again doing this time slider thing, but this time we're just using the regular .plot API to plot uh, this using matplotlib. So that works too, which is also pretty neat. Um, we are also not stuck with the particular type we started with, right? So we might I mean, there's actually a way to go from an X-array object to a data frame. Uh, so we can kind of build a pipeline where we select uh, on the X-ray object by latitude, and then we group it over time and plot the mean temperature at that latitude over time, um, also by method chaining here. So we're chaining, uh, going from an X-ray object to a pandas object, uh, just chaining this operation. And now we can kind of select the latitude we want to look at and see how that changes the air temperature. Um, so really, it's very, very flexible. Um, and we can do almost anything in this way. Um, another thing that we've kind of focused on is panel. This is all built on panel. So panel is a natural kind of widget library that you, you can use. Uh, but if you want to use an IPR widget, that sort of works too. You can just drop in any IPR widget uh, object in place of the panel object, and that'll work the same. So here we've got a, a player widget uh, from IPR widgets, which we dropped in, and we get our little player. Um, okay, so I kind of, let me just check the time. Okay, uh, I do want to leave some time for questions, just, um, but what I did promise you is that we're not just building pipelines, we're, we can actually build an actual application and a polished application at that from using this, right? And so what we're going to do here is we're again going to start with a different data set. In this particular case, we kind of, we're going to go through the entire process of building an application here. Um, so. I just drag this off screen a little bit. Um, so what we're starting with here is this earthquakes data set. This is the earthquakes earthquakes across the entire globe uh, over, I think, a decade. I'm not quite sure. Um, we again start with this data set, this, which is, again, a data frame. We make it interactive. We add some widgets. And then we, again, use regular Pandas API to do the filtering, kind of to allow us to filter these earthquakes by magnitude. Now, this is the minimum magnitude. Uh, we again use a date range slider to filter it by time. And then we look at what that looks like, right? We again have this little uh, interactive thing just to view the uh, just to view the table and preview the table. And now we're going to kind of create um, various filters, uh, various plots of this. Um, so let me just go back so that we can actually see the plot. Um, so there's something odd about this. Uh, let me re-execute. Uh, that doesn't work. Oh, up on the slide. Sorry about this. Uh, so we're just going to re execute this and then go back here. I think I'd re execute this as well. And now we can actually see uh, all of these uh, earthquakes across the world. Um, if I could actually go back, then yes, we can see them all. Sorry about that. And so now we can zoom in and actually look at this is, I mean, several thousand earthquakes, right? Across the entire globe. Um, and we can see all of them, and using the data shader library, we can visualize and make sure this is still interactive. So we declared this geo plot we're going to add to our little dashboard. We're going to create some other plots we're going to add to the dashboard. Here are some histograms we're going to add. Um, another thing we might want to add is a little uh, table. Again, this is Sorry about this. Uh, Rise is kind of cutting my things off, so I have to go back and forth a little bit. Uh, but here, again, we're going to create a table using the tabulator library to kind of view the, the particular earthquakes that we've subselected. Right? Uh, so again, we allow, this allows us to filter the whole thing. Um, and so we're just creating various components to add to our little dashboard. Right? And all of, this, all of these components are created using uh, the uh, interactive API. We finally lay this whole thing out together. Um, here, we're going to put the plots in a separate tab from the table. And so this is what uh, panel will let you do. Kind of, It provides various layouts that let, lets us lay things out in different ways uh, using either columns or tabs. 
Um, again, this is a little bit cut off, uh, but in the final polished dashboard, we'll see that this uh, actually looks pretty nice. Um, and so just to summarize what we've just done is we've kind of taken, making, made our earthquake data set interactive. Uh, we've filtered it in some ways. We've created various plots from it, such as the geographic plot, uh, histograms. Uh, we've created a little table from that. We've put that into a set of tabs. And now we're going to add all of that to our little polished dashboard template. Uh, so panel, if you don't know, it provides various uh, templates that you can just drop your components into. And the API for that is very simple. So all we're going to do here is uh, append our widgets to the sidebar, append our tabs um, to uh, the main area, and then we're going to preview this thing. Uh, just let me sure before we do that, let me just make sure that I re-executed this so that it all just works. Um, and now uh, this show method will let us preview this. If we actually deploy it, we could kind of put this in a script or in a notebook and make that uh, work nicely as well. And so here, um, just by adding this interactive pipeline that we've built uh, to a dashboard, uh, to this template, we can create this really nice polished dashboard. We can kind of change our filters. Uh, we can adjust the filters. Uh, the other nice thing we added to this dashboard, and if you've watched very closely, I added this thing called linked selections, uh, which I actually talked about at PyData Global last year, uh, which kind of lets us filter uh, by region. So let's take this, uh, this region here over Japan um, and filter by that, um, which allows us kind of see um, here. All the other plots will update in response to the selection now, because I used linked selections. Uh, you may be able to see in the background very faintly the full data set and then the subset of, of kind of data points that fall into, that correspond to the region I selected. I can further sub-select, right? Uh, just select magnitudes. Uh, from five and higher or seven and higher, or I could also subselect the depth. Um, and then even the table will update correspondingly. And so we primarily have uh, earthquakes in Japan and uh, Russia selected now. Um, so hopefully what you can take away from this is uh, just in a few lines of code or using APIs that you already know, you can build uh, an interactive pipeline um, um, and then drop the resulting plots, the resulting analyses into a little panel uh, template and get a really nice and polished application. And I think this is less than 60 lines of code total. I think it's probably more like 40 actually. Um, this also has a nice feature. You can kind of, oh, I don't think it works in this particular case, uh, but you should also be able to toggle between dark and light themes. Okay, uh, so let me just go back to our little presentation here. Um, hopefully, we still have some time for uh, questions. Uh, hopefully, I can go to the last slide. All we need, I think I just crashed my browser, um, so we're going to finish it here. The last slide, just uh, thanks all of you for joining here. Um, maybe I can restart that. Uh, thanks for joining, everyone. Uh, you can find uh, more information about this at um, holoviz.org. Uh, so this has a whole tutorial explaining all of this. If you have any questions, you can visit us at discourse at holobiz.org. Um, and really, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions at this point. Thanks very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Philip. This was a wonderful presentation, and I really like the demos. Uh, so we have do we do have questions for you. Uh, the first question is like, what is the software you're using for to present? I think this okay. is Rise, right? This is Rise, that's right, yes. Yeah. I've been using it for years. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, Damien, Damien Avia um, developed it originally. Um, it's really great. It's really just a wrapper around notebooks. Um, so maybe if I drop back out of here, if you install the extension for a classic notebook, you get a little button here um, that lets you kind of uh, present. And it also lets you kind of annotate with, for each cell, whether that should be a slide or a fragment. OK, hopefully. That covers that. Yeah. Uh, so people are really keen on seeing our slides. So would you please share these and uh, share the notebook in the uh, Slack channel? In the Slack channel, um, I will have to upload it. Um, I haven't. I only just put the final tweaks on it. Um, so if you go to my GitHub, I'm going to create a new repo. I'll call it PyData. Oh, maybe we can just do that together now. Um, I'll create a new repo called. Uh, PyData Global 2021, and I'll put it in there. Um, I do have another comment. Comment which code, which is this is great. This is great presentation. The total opposite of death by PowerPoint. 
Yeah. Uh, the other question is by Andrea. Uh, does it does it also work in a streamlit app? That's a very good question. I I haven't tried. Um, so in theory, at least it will render. I don't know if the widgets the widgets probably won't respond, unfortunately. Um, so you can use panel instead, which kind of competes. <laughs> We've heard a little bit. I think there was a discussion yesterday, uh, which I unfortunately had to miss about the drawbacks of panel versus streamlet. Um, but I, uh, I'll hopefully start a conversation with the streamlet devs so we can kind of hopefully make this work somehow. OK, uh, the other question is, how is this deployed to users? OK, so if you, uh, that's a very good question. So if you go to panel and the user guide, it has a whole section on kind of uh, deployment, uh, deploying and export, uh, particularly server deployment. Uh, really, there is a command line uh, command line arguments or command line tool where you can just do a panel serve uh, and point it to the dashboard, and then that'll, that'll start a server, uh, which you can deploy on any of your favorite cloud providers, uh, such as like, well, AWS, Google Cloud, or wherever you want. Um, so here, the show method really just just to preview. If you instead put servable here. Uh, and save that. I could now run on the command line panel serve uh, PyData 2021 IPYNB, and that would start a server, which you can deploy on any of your favorite cloud servers. Right? Yeah, that seems like an easy way and you know very accessible. Yeah, uh, so Philip, we are almost at the time. So uh, I would just close this presentation and thank you very much for joining us today and you know giving this beautiful presentation. Thanks so very much for yeah. moderating. And yeah, I'll post the this repo here, uh, there once I've uploaded the slides as well. Sure. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks everyone. Bye.